this is the final video in this series where we went through investigating a ransomware attack within an AWS cloud environment. Everything from the S3 bucket being accessed and objects being stolen from it, being deleted from it, a ransomware note being uploaded, looking at an attacker, establishing persistence, and a bunch of other crazy things that happened in regards to this ransomware attack. In this final video, we'll be exploring defense evasion that was a part of this ransomware attack. And we're looking at how an attacker was able to disable some defense mechanisms within the environment and also ensure that some of their activities were not tracked due to this defense evasion tactics. So with that being said, let's get into the video. Also, if you haven't seen the very first three videos in this series, I definitely recommend checking them out. I will bundle them up in a nice playlist that will be linked in the description below and also pinned as the very first comment in this video. With that being said, let's get right into the video. All right, we're back here in part four of investigating ransomware and we have a couple of questions here. The first question is, it seems as if server access login was disabled. What was the the name of the IAM user that disabled server access login? When was it disabled? And also what API call was made to disable server access login? So once again, like, like I mentioned in past videos, if you're not quite sure what the API call for something is, you could just Google it. So let's do a server access login disabled CloudTrail API call. Actually, let's see, enabling AWS S3 server access login. Let's take a look at that one and try to scroll through here. Actually, let's go into login with CloudTrail, CloudTrail events, and there's a bunch of API calls here, but, but one thing I'm familiar with it, with S3 bucket is put bucket something something. And when you put bucket something something, like you put a bucket tag in or a bucket version in, you're basically applying certain settings to that bucket. So I wonder if this put bucket login or put something uh, will be related to server access login. And let's take a look at what this put bucket login API call is. So it sets the login parameters for a bucket and and specifies permission for who can view and modify the login parameters. Now, this is just a hunch as to what could possibly be the API call. And also just kind of like spelunking around and trying to figure out something that seems possibly similar to what you would think a login change would be for the S3 bucket. So let's go back into our AWS environment and go to Athena, which we've been using to do all our querying and try to answer this question. What I'll do here is I'll just create a new query here and just grab this query again and just play out that comment and let's look at where the event name is put bucket login again we're working on a bit of a hunch here just because i'm somewhat familiar with how the api calls work and like the naming convention so it's kind of easy to approach some of these api calls and you know sort of have a level of understanding of what they could possibly be doing and then test that hypothesis out by running this query and voila we have a result for that and i'm actually gonna enhance these results here so let's just wrap lines and then make the columns resizable as well. All right. I think that looks maybe better anyways. So, so we see that this was done by an IAM user. We see that this was done by Rodev, which was the user that also created the ransom note and all of that stuff earlier on in the compromise investigation, which was in the very first video. And we also saw it in the last video as well. And if we scroll further, we see they're using the cloud shell. Seems like the same IP address. And it does look like this activity is happening against this bucket. So, so, so I do think that this actually answers this question. So let's actually copy this bucket ARN right here. And I'm just going to do a affected bucket here. Now, one thing I do want to confirm is looking within the request parameters. All right, perfect. We have the request parameters here. Maybe I should just remove this wrap lines. All right, let's try it again and look through the request parameters. Where did that go? All right, perfect. So let's drag this out. And then if we look in the request parameters, because the request parameters typically tells us details about the request. So we see the bucket login status for this. And it seems like this is a link here. So I wonder where this link leads. It's pretty interesting. So let's take a look at that. Huh, weird. Bucket login status is that. That is kind of weird within the request parameters. Nothing else here. So I might have been wrong about my hunch with the put bucket login API call. And that might have just led us down a bit of a rabbit hole. But let's expand this a little bit further to see if there's any more details. Well, yeah, there are not much more details there that I think are going to be relevant. So I'm going to revert to the walkthrough to see the approach 
there. All right, so in the walkthrough, it looks like they're using guard duty. And, was, and I do remember guard duty being enabled uh, early on when we were setting up the workshop. So let's actually go and look at guard duty. Now, typically you'd have guard duty sending you alerts, whether it's like through SNS or like to your SIM. So let's take a look at guard duty here though. And since this happened a while back, let's do the last 30 days. All right, and we have a couple of findings, a findings for a Kate's GOAT cluster, which I'm currently running right now for Kubernetes GOAT. Let's just view all findings. All right, so, okay, cool. So we see this finding type for a low severity finding for server access login disabled. So this is basically a native guard duty alert. And we can actually just copy this and look at what it does because guard duty has a pretty sufficient documentation about its finding types. And if we look in here and just search for that, yep, S3, let's look at that. So this finding informs you that S3 server access login is disabled for a bucket within your AWS environment. If disabled, no web request logs are created for any attempts to access the identify S3 bucket. However, S3 management API calls such as delete bucket are still tracked. If S3 data event login is enabled through CloudTrail for this bucket, web requests for objects within the bucket will still be tracked. Disabling login is a technique used by unauthorized users in order to evade detection. And you can learn more about it from these different docs. So you have an idea of what this particular finding does. And it's a low severity finding. So let's go back in there and take a look at these details. It says Amazon S3 server access login was disabled for this bucket by this user calling this API call. Okay, so we were actually right with our initial analysis for using this API call within Athena when we were doing the search earlier on. And it says here, this can lead to the lack of visibility into actions taken on the affected S3 buckets and its objects if an event occurs. And if we scroll through, we can see the different details when it was created, when it was updated, we can see the access key, the principal ID, the user type, the username responsible for it, the affected resource. We can also see the different details about this bucket, the owner, the different tags, the action that was taken, the actor, the location. So this is very, very robust details, you know, like something you might see like in a security alert or in a security signal, which is, you know, also why some people send their guard duty signals to their SIM. And guard duty should be one of the first things you enable when you set up your AWS environment, if you're going to be doing security and logging for that environment, because it's just bare bones detections already provided to you by Amazon. Either way, we can basically answer all the questions we have here. So the first question is, what is the name of the IAM user that disables server access login? And we can see the IAM user details here. Uh, it's the road dev user, which we already saw earlier on in the series. And then what time was it disabled? The time it was disabled was, let's see, let's scroll back down here, created at this time right here. So this was when it was disabled, I imagine. I don't see any other, yes, yeah, 2629, 2302, 03, 26, 29. Okay, yeah, so this has to be the time when it happened, 2302.27. And this is local time when it happened, not UTC. Next question is, what was the API call that was made to disable server access login? And then we're able to actually validate that the API call that was made is the put bucket login API call. Now we have a bonus question here. The customer has made you aware of another top secret, highly confidential file, company secrets dot doc. Was this object deleted? Was it taken? Now we've done a sort of search like this before. So let's go back into Athena, click on that. And then the query we're in, and we're looking for where, again, request parameters, very helpful stuff. And something like this. And we're just gonna use quotes here and then anything that it looks like that particular doc right there. And let's run that query. Cause like I'm missing something here. Oh, add a equal to there. So let me just take out that equal to necessarily placed it there. Okay. So we don't have any results for this. So to answer that question, well, it's very obvious that this object was not deleted. Neither was it taken, at least according to what we're able to search for here within CloudTrail Lake. And yeah, that's about it. We've been able to answer all the questions required for part four. Now you can go to the walkthrough details and look at some of the other stuff there. At the very end, there's some instructions on how to actually test a bucket login and all that fun stuff and even validate that it actually works. So I definitely recommend, you know, digging deeper and trying that out for yourself and just getting the experience with it. But now that we're done with this section, let's go into the cleanup section. Now this is basically going to cover cleaning up all the resources that were created during this workshop. So let's go back in here and we'll go into CloudFormation because that was what we used to deploy all these resources. So search for CloudFormation, click on that and clearing 
figuring all of these things out is as simple as clicking on the stack name and just clicking delete and it would delete this stack with all the resources that it created and if we reload that we can see that the status is a delete in progress now there are more details about how to finish up the cleanup within this guide so i won't be going further into that it should be fairly straightforward but if you run into any issues be sure to leave a comment down below but this has been a really fun scenario to investigate all the way from the start to the finish of identifying different activities we actually started from using CloudFormation to create all the resources within our cloud environment and then we used a bash script to use AWS Cloud Shell to simulate the ransomware based event and then used Athena and SQL to sift through the cloud trail log data to identify all the different activities the attacker performed within the cloud environment. We also used a native AWS threat detection tool like GuardUD to provide supplementary details about the removal of server access login on an S3 bucket. We've looked at so much stuff and learned a lot from just this forensic and incident response scenario and I'm super excited to be continuing on this series with the rest of the labs provided by the AWS CERT team on different scenarios around AWS incident response. But if you've come this far, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like videos like this, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with anyone who you think will find value in it. It really helps with the channel and it helps keep making these videos as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. This video is brought to you by my LinkedIn learning course. I've spent the last couple of years immersed in the world of cybersecurity, dedicating my career to detecting, responding, and building engineering solutions for threats against cloud environments, including ones for Fortune 500 companies and even some of your favorite tech and non-tech companies. From this invaluable experience, I have created comprehensive cloud forensics and incident response labs on training platforms you're familiar with like Let's Defend and Blue Team Labs Online by Security Blue Team. And these labs were designed for individuals keen on learning how to detect and respond to cloud threats. But you know what? I felt like I could do way more. And that's why I'm excited to present to you my very first course on LinkedIn Learning, introducing my introduction to AWS Threat Detection course. In this course, you'll dive into the essentials needed to build and enhance your skills in AWS Threat Detection. Whether you're a SOC analyst, a cloud security engineer, a cloud engineer, a DevOps engineer, or a DevSecOps engineer, this course has got you covered with all the necessary knowledge that you need to kickstart your journey in AWS Threat Detection. So if that sounds exciting to you, make sure to click the link in this video description or the pinned comments or the link in my bio to get started. I can't wait to see you in the course.